Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Daniels. And I'm David Leeser. And today we're going to have David Leeser walk us through a really interesting presentation about planning for skills-based organization transformation and the relationship that that has with digital credentialing. So we'll jump straight in. And David's assembled a few slides for us here that we're going to walk through uh, to cover this topic. So, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, you know, everybody's talking about skills-based talent transformation, and they're talking about skills-based training and skills-based hiring. But I think that there's the missing link to make this happen is the skills cloud. A couple things just to set the stage on this thing. The, the roles in the new economy are starting to cluster into the jobs of the future. And you can see what they're starting to look like. There's cloud computing. There's product development. There's still going to be sales, obviously. Content is going to be a big one. All, all people and culture is a big one. Data and AI, obviously, is a big one. Um, engineering and marketing. Those are the areas that the jobs are starting to cluster into. So there's obvious breaks in the way jobs are starting to uh, form into these different areas. And, and the skills that you're going to need in these jobs are starting to emerge as well. And World Economic Forum did a great view of what the top 10 skills are going to be most demand in 2025. And a lot of them are not surprising. They're very human skills. They're very transferable skills. They're what we often used to call soft skills, but now they're be called, you know, we're starting to call them essential skills, resilience, leadership, emotional intelligence, technology use. These are the skills that are needed in the era of robots. Just a quick observation there. We see this more and more these days, the importance and the emphasis being placed on these kinds of skills. What do you think is driving that um, in today's economy, in today's work world? I think there are a couple things that are driving it. One is the, the, the nature of work is changing. I mean, that's a big one, right? So everything from the right. jobs are changing so quickly that the skills that we used to think of as being durable are not durable anymore. You know, all the technical skills that were durable are now changing every two years. But these are the skills that are needed in across the entire spectrum of jobs in an enterprise. And I think that people are starting to realize when you look at it, hey, you know what, all these different technical skills, I mean, a, look at what's happening with generative AI this year. I mean, it came out of nowhere and now it's gonna dominate the labor market at least for the next several years. And so I think people have a harder time predicting those things, but these skills here are the skills that are transferable. So whether you're you know, working with AI or you're working with some other technology, you're gonna to need to have some creativity. You're gonna to need to have critical thinking, right? You're gonna to need to be a problem solver and you're absolutely gonna to need to have resilience because of this, the, all of these changes. I think there's a lot of different drivers for it. I think also the nature of people's position in an organization changing as well. People are leaving their jobs. They're not staying put anymore. They're moving from one job to the next. And these are the skills that regardless of where they end up landing, these are the skills that they're going to be able to carry with them. That's really interesting. You know, we've heard for quite some time now about how AI would change the landscape in terms of, uh, you know, skills that people would need to know, regardless of what job you're in. And obviously, since generative AI has come onto the scene and things like Jet, chat GPT and all the other similar types of applications, it sort of doesn't matter what role you're in or what industry you're in. S suddenly, you know, there's a there's going to be a need to embrace that. And I think to do that effectively seems to make sense that having this full suite of skills is going to really help with that. Yeah, and you know, w people are starting to r recognize that. And if you look at this came out from Coursera with the World Economic Forum, they looked at what are the skills that people are looking for when they're looking for skills development and training. And look at the differences from 2019 to 2020. Now, obviously there's, you know, a pandemic uh, impact to this as well. But, you know, who who thought that mindfulness and meditation and gratitude and listening skills would be things that people are seeking out when they're looking for training and development. Those are things we didn't even think about. I mean, if you look over on the 2019, writing was there, right? But, um, and deep learning was there, but kindness was not really there, right? Um, so the people are starting to seek this type of training because they're starting to see it. And, and then if you look even deeper at the job postings themselves, you'll see that those skills are starting to show up in the job postings. 
So this came from Gad Lebanon from Burning Glass Institute, where he looked at all of the jobs from 2022, and he looked at what skills, what key skills and, you know, uh, had the highest market value. In, this was in the United States in 2022. Well, look at this list of the top 24. Of those 24 skills, and by the way, he looked at the jobs, he looked at the, what the salaries were and all these other things, and he was able to create this, you know, parse out that information. 17 of those 24 are cognitive capabilities and personality traits. I mean, it's, it's amazing that these are the skills that, and so again, they are starting to show up in the job descriptions as well. So, you know, these predictions that are, have, are now coming true in, a, in an AI world, we're going to have to start to focus on these durable human skills. People are going out and they're looking for the training and the jobs are paying more for people who have these skills. Which is which is pretty pretty remarkable. Well, and two things really stand out here when I look at this. One is organizations need to be thinking about how they assess for this. Either you know whether it's you know existing employees or it's you know future employees, whatever it may be. And then of course you have to think about uh, if you assess for it uh, and you capture that information. You know how do you capture it and how do you surface it, and make it available you know, to uh, all the important parts uh, of an HR talent management stack, you know, within your organization, so. Yeah, because these things aren't transparent. Right. And these things don't show up on diplomas and they don't show up really in even in a lot of performance reviews and they certainly don't show up on resumes. Um, people don't typically say that I, you know, I can deal with ambiguity on my resume, right? Um, you have to kind of figure out how do, you, how, do you, how do you identify that? And the problem is, the problem is, is that most organizations are focused on the technical skills. Like you just said, they're just, you know, they're assessing for technical skills. Does this person have Excel capabilities? Do they understand these cloud technologies? Do they understand AI or uh, are they, you know, maybe it's down to a Python or a programming language or something else. We're really very good at assessing those things and giving a certificate for that. But we're not doing a good job on the rest of it. And if you look at the, at the stack, the pyramid of what we need to know about every single employee in the organization in the era of robots and in AI. We need to know these durable skills as a foundation. Like you just said, we need to know what are the personality traits this person has? What are the cognitive skills? Do they have domain knowledge in this area? Do they understand banking or energy or whatever it is, right? Do they have actual job knowledge in marketing or sales or customer service or, or whatever happens? And then do they understand the business enablers to get that job done? Some jobs are going to require project management or design thinking or, or other things, right? These are the ways of working type of skills. And all we're focused now on are these technical skills, and they're the least durable in the entire pyramid. So it's pretty remarkable. This is, you know, that we haven't gotten to the point where we're really assessing, like you said. I mean, you look at this and what really just jumps out at me is, for the most part, folks are only evaluating or tracking and documenting one sixth of um, the skills that they need to be tracking within their organization. Yes, that's and and by the way, they're not even doing a very good job of that. You know, they're right. doing it, you know they're not they're not doing it in a way that makes it very easy to consume by everybody in the organization. They there may be a few select people in HR that can mine the database or an L and D that can mine the database, but it's certainly not, it's not reaching the level of making C-suite decisions with this type of information. Right, and that's the key, right, is how do you, you know, even if you're capturing this or you have a plan to capture this information, uh, once you have it, is it consumable? That is the key. Right, and that's yeah. where the need for a skills cloud comes in. If you're, you know, as organizations start to move towards skills-based hiring, skills-based training, Quiet hiring is another term right now where people are, quiet hiring is nothing more than saying, hey, you know what, I know what skills people have, I know what their adjacencies are, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to ask them if they'd like to move into a new role. Um, you can't do that, any of this stuff, unless you take full inventory of all of these capabilities and align that to the jobs to be done. And so that's what this is about, is the six steps. How do you do that? How do you build a skills cloud? And so that's the action plan here. So starting with number one, you have to establish a framework to capture these capabilities. You have to be able to say, first of all, how, let's all speak the same language. 
right? So you need to be able to create or buy or use a framework. This is a, a future focus framework from my inner genius. There are other ones out there from Lightcast. There, you know, there are a number of them out there. I think McKinsey might have one. Deloitte might have one. I don't know who has them, but it, a lot of people have frameworks. But the point is, across the organization, you need to either buy or build or use a framework. And this is a good start. You know, there's the thinking domain, the interacting domain, you know, the leading domain, the digital domain, the, the specialties and the achieving domains. These are the big bucket areas of skills and capabilities that will comprise an entire organization. There's not an organization that probably doesn't comprise these. And this is a big missing piece, I think, for the most part across uh, employers today, right? They don't have that real tight framework that's really needed. No, and they don't. And if they, if there is one, it might be kept close to the vest in HR, and it doesn't seem to flow into L and D very well. And it certainly doesn't flow down to the right. lines of business. And it really, it needs to start with the line of business on what's the jobs to be done, right? Uh, and maybe the that's the the bigger issue or the real issue is the fact that it um, it, it does kind of sit within a vacuum and is yes. not being utilized. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't fit with the actual documentation of the capabilities that for, for the entire organization. Um, so let me, so the, the, the framework, I mean, this is a little more detail, right? So the framework that you create is going to be the inventory of all your capabilities. This is how you populate your skills cloud. First thing you do is you create a, or use a framework like this. These are the types of skills. And by the way, these are the skills that will show up in your assessments. These are the ones that should show up in your job descriptions. These are the ones that should show up. Of course, we, we're going to talk about that in digital badges, right? These should be part of the metadata in the badge itself mm -hmm. or the signal of achievement, whatever that happens to be, or the certificate. So this gets into a lot of depth. This is kind of an eye chart, but this is the level of, of granularity that an organization, every organization needs to get to if they really want to implement a skills-based talent transformation. Oh, yeah. This, I mean, this is excellent. This is this is something you just typically don't see when you're thinking about trying to build these frameworks or you know how granular do you need to go in terms of um, you know ass assessing these skills and how does that how do you break that out you know categorically uh, this is fantastic so step number one like we just said is first thing you need to do is find a framework build a framework. Um, at, that covers the you know the the breadth and scope of the uh, of the jobs in your in your organization. Next thing you need to do is you need to break down the jobs. So what's the job to be done, and align it to that framework. So you have your framework, and now let's go back. Let's interview the organization, or let's take inventory. What are the jobs that need to be done? What are the roles to get the job done? Right. Then let's get down into the capabilities and the granular skills that are needed to do that. And this is Josh Burson's uh, work as well. Um, but so, so now, we, now we can break this thing down. So we have this thing, we can align that framework to these jobs, and that's step number two, right? And then we can then take inventory. Now we, now we, can, as we can start to establish an assessment strategy, like you just said. So how do you start to figure out in all of these different domains, how do you figure out who has what capabilities? You know, a lot of people rely on the job that the person did in the past. That's a terrible way to do it. Right. You know, or, or a performance review from a manager, which is just laden with bias. Right. So you, in, like you just said, in order to really have a deep understanding of what makes people tick and what skills and capabilities they have individually, and then create this collective skills registry. You need to assess the personality traits, the cognitive skills, other domain knowledge that you have across the organization, the, the job knowledge you have across the organization, the technical skills, and the business enablers. All of those areas that we just showed in the pyramid. These are the, and these are some examples, you know, technical skills, C plus, everybody knows how to do that. We can, you know, give people a test on C plus plus or Java or, or look at their code, right? Mm -hmm. But all these other ones, people aren't doing a very good job of them. Um, but the personality traits and cognitive skills, th there are excellent personality trait assessments and cognitive assessments out there that can I identify these things in a matter of minutes for an entire organization. 
Um, the domain knowledge, you get that from, you know, courses and exams, and you, you can get that from inference, which is not maybe the best way, but it is one way, and assessments, published works, to see if somebody's had some published works. So, again, the toolkit for doing all of this is listed on the bottom of this chart, and I'm not going to read it, right? But this is the toolkit that L&D needs to assemble in order to really transform into a skills-based uh, uh, training organization. So what's an example of a solution that's out on the market as it relates to how you would go about assessing personality traits and cognitive skills, just for the benefit of those who are listening and viewing? There are a number this. of them out there. Of course, you know, I love Minor Genius. And because oh, Minor right, Genius, right. Has been, it's, it, it has done an excellent job um, and it's been proven millions of times that it works in large organizations. Um, it's not biased. Um, it screens all of the um, information away from uh, the person looking at it so they don't, you know, see the gender and all that other stuff. And it can be done in, and it's been, you know, validated. Uh, and, and those kinds of things can be done in 30 minutes. I mean, literally, there was an organization wow. with about 30,000 employees. And within an hour, they had built the skills cloud on all of the personality traits and cognitive skills for the entire organization. They had it They had it done in an hour. And then they layered on top of that, uh, these other capabilities. And so- That's fantastic. It's, yeah. It, yeah, it's amazing what you can do with technology today. And then once you do that, and you get down to that granular level of understanding using your a decent assessment strategy, you can now map your capabilities for, for in your organization, you can start to look at each individual person in the organization and you can start to map them for progression. And by the way, if you want to keep people happy and you want to make sure that you reduce your attrition rates, which can save an organization a, a, just an enormous amount of money, you need to know at a detailed level what their skills and capabilities are using that type of assessment strategy. And if you look at this, it's going to save an enormous amount of time and money for an organization because you can take a person that's in a customer service rep position, which they're not gonna to wanna to stay in that, they never do. And they're, they have basically these 10 major skills that they need to have to run the, to, to do their job. Well, let's say we wanna move them into a tech support job. Typically, what most people do is say, oh, let's put them through the tech support track, let's put them into the LMS and, and find the tech support courses and run them through all those courses. We don't need to. We only have, you know, a couple of the skills will go latent, and they're not gone, but they're just not needed for this job. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Most of those skills are, are used in the next job. Out of those original 10 skills, eight of those skills are still useful. We only have to pick up four skills. Imagine the savings in time and frustration and resource by saying, all I have to do is I have to upskill them with four little skills. And by the way, I can give them a better job, a better salary. I can keep them engaged and motivated. I don't lose them from the company. If you have all this information, and then you can move them to the third job. And again, some of the skills will go latent from the third job, but you can move a person from customer service rep to tech support to a security analyst in a very, very short period of time if you have an inventory like this. This is, I've seen this chart before. And to me, this is what it's all about. I mean, if you can understand where a person's at today and what those adjacent skills are that they would need to acquire to move along this journey, um, I, I mean, it's a game changer um, to the point you made. I mean, just the sheer amount of money that organizations could save by having this degree of vis visibility um, you know, across their employee ecosystem, as an example, uh, not to mention, you know, the, the time saved, being able to progress people into these um, other roles so much quicker. And it's not that hard to do. And, and speaking of adjacencies, <clears throat> you know, you may not even realize it, but there might be a person in marketing who has a bridge to an IT role or vice versa, a person who's IT, instead of saying, you know what, hey, we don't need more our marketing people anymore, we're gonna lay them off, you know, or we're going to have some other type of resource action or something else, you know, well, guess what? That person in marketing may have a link to an IT job. In this case, you know, marketing, they're probably gonna have sentiment analytics skills, right? 
And that's a perfect link to an, a natural language processing and AI job, right? So we, if they have the aptitude, and we know this from our assessments that they have the aptitude to learn some of these things, maybe Python and TensorFlow and some machine learning, whatever it happens to be, we can upskill that person into a different job in the organization. There are these organizations in IT that laid off an enormous number of people that they considered non-technical because they didn't realize that they had the propensity for those technical jobs, and they may already have some of the capabilities that would be a bridge because they never took inventory. So instead, they create this army of people leaving the organization, and then they have to rehire. This is a great example. I mean, I think typically a person wouldn't think about this, but it just goes to prove that, you know, someone can transition in this way, uh, you know, from one role to another in, in, in ways that, you, again, you typically wouldn't think of, you know, you typically wouldn't think of someone in marketing transitioning into an IT related role, but this proves that it's quite possible, especially through a, a really smart assessment process you know, they can find out if they're actually suited to move into that role, even, even if they don't have the skills, you know, or do they have the capacity to pick those up? The, the, the L and D and the HR organizations. And I know people like Josh Burson talk about this all the time mm -hmm. that have to start to think of themselves as data centers. They have to start to really understand that they are in the data business now more than they are than they ever thought they were before to be able to capture that data in a consumable way to be able to make strategic decisions for organizations. So the first thing that they do to get that data is, like you said, develop a solid assessment strategy for everybody in the organization, take inventory of all those capabilities, uh, map them back to the jobs to be done in the organization with the proper framework. And then what do you do with it? This is the other problem the companies have. They don't know where to go with that. Well, if they are taking, creating all these assessments, let's say they're using the minor genius assessment or they're mm -hmm. you know, an exam for a certification, uh, or it could be a, a, a self-assertion. Somebody created some code and they did, uh, or they did a YouTube video on how to, you know, right. sentiment yeah. analysis, right? Yeah. So, so how do you capture all that information in a consumable way, in a standardized way? That's what I think people are missing about badges. That's where, I mean, th this is the real value. And you say this all the time, Jim, is like, what is this in service of? You know, right. badges are the thing. They're not, you know, uh, they're not the thing. They're, they're, they're. They represent, they represent the thing. They represent the thing, right? Yeah. And, and so why are we not using them in an expanded way to capture at the micro level, all of these capabilities in an organization and then use that information with sophisticated AI systems to make decisions. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's definitely a tendency, and I see this all the time, for uh, folks to look at badges and kind of pigeonhole what, you know, the, their purpose and their need and what they can actually represent. And it's, uh, it's just really unfortunate because as you said, you know, the badge is not the thing, it's representing the thing, and that thing could be anything, right? I mean, and so you have to think about the utility of what a digital badge can actually provide. And, um, you know, going all the way back to the framework that you spoke of earlier, you know, you can build um, in a similar fashion, your credentialing framework and how you leverage badges can be wrapped around that in a really smart way. So you can have categories of badges that represent different kinds of, of uh, information that you wanna have available you know, within your organization to make a lot of these decisions that, you know, and, and facilitate, you know, value back into the business in the ways you've just talked about. So, well, you know what, everybody has to sing from the same songbook. Yeah. And the way you do that is you establish that, like, that's why step number one is that framework. You have to establish the framework first, because that is going to be the, 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 the document of truth, really for the entire organization and the whoever's running the badge or the credential program in the organization has to really own that framework or they have to at least be a big part of that framework. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to flow from HR to L and D to the lines of business to down to the capturing of that information. You know, everything from the job descriptions to um, 
to the signal of capabilities to do those jobs has to line up. And that's how you do it. You create that framework or you, you know, use it, an existing framework and you look at all the different jobs that are out there. You make sure that all those jobs have that discrete understanding of what those are. So you map that out into your jobs. You use that for your job descriptions. You use it for your hiring, for everything else. You take inventory by assessing people for all of those capabilities and you badge it. You badge all of those things. You know, when we started with the badge program at IBM, I remember a lot of headwind against capturing personality traits and cognitive capabilities. Yeah. yeah. Saying, oh, that's less robust and it's not rigorous enough. And in, in turn, it turns out that they are better indicators of on the job performance than technical skills. You know, you think yeah. about it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, to the point of the data that you were sharing earlier about how, you know, all of these cognitive skills and, and so forth have surfaced and become so important. Imagine if organizations, you know, all along have been capturing that. But again, it kind of comes down to this whole thing where, um, you know, the, the idea of incorporating badging into your strategy kind of gets pigeonholed and doesn't get leveraged, you know, as broadly as it should be. It's not just about representing the really super high stakes kinds of accomplishments or, you know, competencies and capabilities in that. There's a lot of other insights um, and a lot of other information that, that could and should be captured using badges. Ultimately, that's the common language that everything could be placed in, which makes it much, much easier to be able to um, dip into that information, build that skills cloud, and make yeah. use of the data in a smart way. And you think about it, because if you allow people to do self-assertions, which is, you know, a big, um, a big part of the, the, the vision and view of the open recognition group, um, then you can now really expand beyond the job to really have a deep understanding of what people are doing. People are out there taking courses. They're out there creating content. They're out there, you know, creating videos and uh, code. They're doing all these other things. Why shouldn't we take a look at that stuff? Either they can badge it themselves and do a self-assertion and then we can have evidence within the badge that says there's a link to it, or we can assess them for it as well. We can do either way. But like you said, the, own, the, the badge today is the best vehicle to get this information into a standardized format, into a standardized database, into a skills registry and build a skills cloud. It is the best way right now. I totally agree. And, you know, and on, on the idea of self-assertion, that has been something, this is, this, this one is really interesting to me because one of the, one of the trends that I've seen over the past couple of years is organizations becoming more and more interested in capturing actual experiences or having experiential types of credentials, things that don't just represent you know, I've been certified or I've completed this training course or whatever it may be, but something that has hard evidence, something really tangible attached to it in the form of evidence that shows a work product or outcome that someone's achieved. The best way, I and I maintain this and I have for a while, the best way to capture that is to encourage self-assertion, you know, and and have that capability built into a credentialing program because your point that you just made, you know, employees are, they're putting their skills and their capabilities to work in a lot of different ways. And they're producing all sorts of work products and so forth. And if, if they have the ability to go self-assert that and create a credential and point directly to those work products and those experiences, then, I mean, that's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, it's a win for everybody. And so all that information flows into the skills cloud, whether it is a self-assertion, whether it's something that was done outside the job, whether it's done <clears> in the <throat> school, or whether it has you know, been assessed by the organization, it all flows in. Human Resources now has one single source of data. Learning and Development has that same source. Workforce centers can, can use that same information and schools as well. So everybody benefits from this. And, you know, back to that whole thing, you know, the, the number of people in the United States and I think worldwide that have some college and no degree, it's so huge. Think about this. If you were giving badges along the way and you were building the skills cloud in a school, and let's say 
you know, I'm a freshman and I come in and I take two or three core classes because I want to have a degree in business. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I also take four or five, I I take four or five courses in things like sculpture or in art or photography or something else. Think about what the school could do to look at that information and go, hey, you know what? Jim says he wants to be a business administrator, but I'm looking at the courses he's taking Right. And I think he's a. I think he's going to be in visual arts and visual design. Let's let's figure that out for Jim. You know, because he might quit. He might go down those business classes and not like them. But guess what? He might be unbelievable doing some sort of visual communications. Mm-hmm. And that maybe is you know we can we have all this data. Think of the the what you could do with AI with that data to say how do we identify flight risks. From, you know, when we have this level of data on a person and how do we start to let say, you know what, all we have to do is upskill them on these two or three things and we can get them on the right path that they're going to love and they're going to provide maximum value for us. Exactly. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. And, you know, and I love this illustration here because, you know, I, when I look at the skills cloud here, it's that single source of truth, which is historically has been something near impossible for an organization to create, right? Because the data lives in so many different areas and trying to, you know, consolidate that and synthesize it in a way uh, to make it easy to, you know, uh, build inference or whatever, whatever kind of insights you're trying to establish from it has historically just been really, really difficult. But it kind of, you know, coming back to, you know, the utility uh, of badges and what they're in service of. If you put in a really smart strategy there, everything that you've walked us through today becomes much, much, much easier and much and, and serves the organization much more effectively. And obviously we wrapped up talking about the value of digital badges and how they it can help with this. But I think this is a perfect, a perfect presentation for people to, to look at if they're thinking about a badging program, because you really need to think it's again, it's not about the badge. It's about what the badges are going to represent. That's where your focus and your attention should be. Yes. And, uh, and this, to me, this, uh, illustrates that beautifully, you know, all the, all the reasons why it's so important to have a strategy in place for how you're going to, uh, have a common language for how you capture and, and define all of this information and then ultimately how you serve it up to the business and all the different parts of the business that need it. And when you Fantastic, think about adding David. AI to this, I remember early on you had done uh, a bit, some early work with AI at IBM with Watson mm-hmm. on the, the badge d- database at, at IBM. And we weren't even thinking about it as a skills cloud back then, but you did. And you looked at the pathways that people were taking and they weren't prescriptive at all. I mean, they weren't following the prescription. You know, they weren't going from course A to course B to course C. Right, I think right. you showed it was like an airline map, right? They were taking one course here and one course there. And think about the possibilities to be able to create better personalized plans for people. If you have this level of data and you basically you're crowdsourcing the data in a way in your organization mm-hmm. to be able to say, I, I know that people are not doing it this way. I have a better recommendation for you. Well, exactly. Right. I mean, the, the traditionally the, the thought process is, you know, if you want to get a person to a certain level of capability, um, and of course us both being originally from IBM, you know, obviously everything was about developing, you know, technical skills that used to be, you know, the really big emphasis kind of going back to your pyramid and that, but it was always thought of in a linear fashion, right? We build this you know, uh, this learning journey, this learning pathway, and it was always very linear. The reality is most learners don't follow a linear path to get from point A to point B, right? Because you don't, you know, their entry points and their exit points tend to differ. And, and also depending on their role, and this gets to the whole thing where, um, you know, the, the, the skills and capabilities you need for a lot of jobs these days is just very fluid, right? And you have to kind of shift on the fly in order to keep pace with the demands of your job role. So that might mean not pursuing a whole learning path, 
but a piece of a learning path in order to add that extra piece of uh, that extra skill or two or three skills to what you do in order to keep, you know, keep effective at what your uh, current job is. Or maybe it, it's because you are trying to get to that next job back to your earlier slide, you know, where you were uh, illustrating how someone could progress through, you know, you don't have to start from scratch to move into another role. You just need to add to the skills that you have because a lot of the skills you already have are potentially transferable. So again, uh, yeah, learning paths are, are rarely linear. You know, they're, uh, uh, they're very dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think again, so, you know, just to wrap on this, badges are going to be an essential component of the skills-based talent transformation and skills-based hiring and skills-based training if people see it you know that way i mean there's mm -hmm. no there's no better way and no easier way for an organization to really trans you know to, to transform into skills-based uh training or skills-based hiring than using badges it's the best way to do it right now yeah and and what you've presented really clearly points that out so david i appreciate you um bringing this topic to us today uh it's it's really eye-opening and i'm sure others will feel the same way uh th this is just fantastic it's a great way to uh if, if anyone i think is thinking about badging or if they have a badging program and they're trying to think you know ways to make it work more effectively for them i think this is this is the what needs to be top of mind so I appreciate yeah. what you've presented to us. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Are you looking to launch a digital badging program or improve an existing one? Look no further than Digital Badge Academy. Our highly popular online masterclass will help you gain the skills and insights necessary to achieve success. Enroll now and start learning today.